If you guys would open your Bibles to Acts chapter 27, we're going we're gonna to go through the entire chapter today. Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27. So if you're scrolling or if you're flipping pages, um, you're going to do it a little bit today. Actually, what we're going to talk about today, and really it's sort of the big theme, you saw it, is that our best laid expectations or our best laid plans are often in conflict with God's perfect will. And so we're going we're gonna to see that today. But this story actually kind of starts in Acts chapter 25, where we get to Acts chapter 27. It actually, you can go all the way back to Acts chapter 25, where Paul is brought before um, King Agrippa. And uh, Festus has taken over the province, and he's got this leftover prisoner from the, the previous administration, and his name is Paul. And so he gives, he says, you know, the, the Jews, they brought him in here. They, they had all kinds of accusations against him. In Rome, we don't play that game, so you, you have to have your accuser come, and there has to be a trial, and there has to be uh, that Acts 26 is Paul speaking his defense before King Agrippa, but he does something in there, and we're going to see it at the end of Acts chapter 26. He does something that causes Acts chapter 27 to take place. And what he does is he says, I want to go before Caesar on this. I want you to and he knows, because he's both a Roman citizen and a Jew, he says, I'm, I know if I call to be brought before the emperor on this, I don't want this to be a local trial. I, I, I want this to go all the way to the emperor. He has that right to do it. And so he calls for that. He then spends Acts chapter 26 basically sharing his testimony and preaching the gospel. And you know, King Agrippa has this opportunity and at the end, right before we get to Acts chapter 27, he finishes. He says to King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? He gets done preaching and he says, do you believe all of that? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. He closes with that. Verse 30 of Acts chapter 26. Then the king rose and the governor and Bernice and those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, this man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free. If he had not appealed to Caesar, he basically said, hey, we'd have let him walk today. After I heard all that, I'd have let him walk. But he wants to go to Caesar with this. He could have been free. It could have gone another way, but this is what Paul knew had to happen. He must go to Rome. Now we get to Acts chapter 27. Let's get to Acts chapter 27. Let's pray and get started. Father, be with us as we journey through this amazing chapter in your scripture and be with us as we receive that which you have for us today. And I know there are many that struggle with your perfect will. There are many that are sometimes finding themselves in conflict with your perfect will. But Lord, we will see by the end that your perfect will will always be done despite our best efforts to kick against the pricks. In Jesus' name, amen. Acts 27. And when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in a ship from Adraminium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. The next day, we put into Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. 
Now I want to stop right there for a minute. Let's, let's back up and read who Julius is. Julius is a centurion of the Augustan cohort. So in the Roman army, there is legions and cohorts and then centuries. So these are, these are military structures, okay? So, so a legion would be battalion or, or division level. Uh, uh, and then you have your, your cohorts, which would be your, your next lower unit. And then you have centuries, which were units of 100 men or less, okay? Normally they average 75 to 80 men. The Augustan cohort is the cohort that is assigned the protection of the emperor, okay? So normally a prisoner transport is going to be done by, you know, alpha company of the, the beanbag cohort, okay? So the, the, the Augustan cohort doesn't do prisoner transport. So this prisoner is super important because the the, the emperor's hundred dudes are leaving their post and coming and getting this guy and taking him to Rome, okay? So this, this is a valued target. So to be in the Augustan cohort, you've got to be a BA dude, okay? You, you, can't, just, you can't just roll up in there and, and been Barney's, you know, buddy, okay? Julius was super super warrior. But he shows kindness to Paul. So what we don't see here is what developed in the time that Paul and Julius were together. There must have been a relationship that formed and formed rapidly that Julius would let every guard down and allow this man to go and be treated kindly, prepared for this. This is a long trip. This is going to be a long trip. They're going to be on a boat. He's in shackles, metal shackles that have probably worn the skin off of his wrists. So he allows Paul to go to his Christian friends in the area and be treated and, and prepared for the trip. This is unheard of. This is unheard of that this would actually happen. A Roman centurion showing kindness to a prisoner. There must have been some type of a relationship that was formed there that Julius thought high of Paul. And we're going to see that later. We're going to see it. We're going to see that it develops. But this is unheard of. This is how God's people should have relationship with the people who might not end up being our friends who shouldn't really, in reality, be someone who shows us kindness, but because God oozes out of us, because Jesus' way oozes out of us, we have a relationship with someone that they're willing to risk their own head. If, if Paul would have been snuffed away by the Christians and, and taken into the deep underground to hide from Rome, Julius would have lost his head. And so... This is amazing to me that this man shows kindness to Paul and lets him go be with his friends and be cared for. Verse 4, putting out to sea. From there we sailed under the, <clears throat> excuse me, the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. And when we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we made it to Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria, sailing for it for Italy and put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off Nidus. And as the wind did not allow us to go further, we sailed under the lee of Crete off Salmon. Now, I want to stop right there. Can you throw that map up for me? So sometimes when we read, we just kind of go, what town was that? What town was that? We don't even really pay close attention. But what's happening here is they're, they're sailing here. Okay, they leave here. They head here. They head on up. 
they're having a difficult time. Now, here's the normal path that they would have taken. I'm going to show it to you. It's not on the map. Here's the normal path they would have taken because this is a ship out of Alexandria that is going to Italy, and they were going to hit all the ports along the way, dropping off supplies and things that were on the ship. This is where they would normally have. This is the normal route. Actually, you could go back and you can look in the back of your Bible and there's some uh, maps there that show you Paul's first missionary trip and second missionary trip. And you're going to see a difference when it comes to Paul's third missionary trip because this is Paul's third missionary trip and they're all over the place. We're going to see that as we travel today through this passage. But this is where they would have gone normally. They would have normally just sort of hung the coast, dropped off, come along through here, and made it up there to Italy. And then the, the centurion would have loaded him on a cart and taken him across the peninsula to Rome. That's how they were supposed to go. That was the normal. That's what everybody, including Paul, likely, had in mind for the trip. Here we start to have some problems. The wind won't let us go anywhere. It won't let us do what we normally do. Something is intervening and causing us to have to go a little bit more south. Verse 8. Coasting, uh, coasting along, it with difficulty, we came to a place called the Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lycia. Now here's where it gets fun. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over. So what this is doing is telling us what time of year it is. Hey, the fast is over. Winter's here. We're, it's not good travel time to be in a wooden ship in the ocean. Okay, this, is, this, is, this isn't a good time. So the, Luke is telling us here, hey, um, hey, the fast has passed. This is a sign to most professional sailors that we hunker down for the winter. Okay? Paul advised them. This is, our, this is our first proclamation from Paul in the story. Paul advised them. He says, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also our lives. Now, pay attention and note that the author doesn't call him by his name in this one moment. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because of the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing both south, west, and northwest, and spend the winter there. Now, this is really, this is this, anybody that served in the military, you're going to understand this. Can I get my map back? So, here's where they are. They're down at the bottom of Crete, okay? And there's this, let's see, it's right here. There's this little town here called Fairhavens. They made it here. Amazing that they even made it here. And Paul's going, huh, we're a little off track here. Winter's here. This is, and we're all dead. If they leave here, we're dead. Now, they're, he's not a professional sailor, but he's sailed a lot. He's been on a lot of boats. He's made a lot of trips. He's made this trip a couple times, and he knows you don't go down here in the winter. So they're at this little town called Fairhavens. And they, what they're saying is, uh, Fairhavens isn't good enough. We got to get to Phoenix. Let me tell you why they want to go to Phoenix. Fairhavens is Barbersville, okay? But Phoenix is Las Vegas, okay? That's where everybody winters before they cast out after the fast. The sailors on the ship are saying, we're not staying in Barbersville. Hey, boss, we're, this is, if anybody has a King James, I don't know if anybody in here has a King James Bible, but the, 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 the translation for the word there, suitable, is actually commodious. It says that the Fair Havens wasn't comfortable enough for them to stay there all winter. And the writer even says, hey, it's, it's right near the city of Lycia. There's some stuff there. It's right near Huntington, right? It's cool. There's a little bit of stuff. Uh-uh. Sailors and soldiers now, elite soldiers, they want to go to Las Vegas to winter. We got to get to Phoenix 
And Paul is saying, hey guys, the wind's been trying to tell us something already. We should listen. You know why? Because he knows who controls the wind. Well, here we go. Verse 13. Now, when the south wind blew gently, suppose that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete, close to the shore. Seems like everything's going fine. Here, I can see the master and owner of the ship. Now, listen, here's why the centurion made this decision. He's got a lot of voices in his ear. He's got the captain of the ship who has guapalicious payday coming when he gets to where he's got to go. And if he parks at the fair havens, he's going to lose some sailors because it ain't that much of a horse ride up to Phoenix. And when they ride on up to Phoenix, they're going to find another ship to, to carry out on. They're not contracted, so he's going to lose his guys. And he knows those Roman soldiers ain't going to pick a finger up to offload that cargo when they get where they're going. So he's going, hey, uh, hey, uh, Julius, we need to, um, we need, there's a little, there's a town where my guys are going to be good with staying, and it's up here. We just, it's, we're going to float along the coast. It's not going to be a big deal. Don't listen to that stupid preacher. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, here we go. Verse 13, they're just floating along Crete. They're almost to Phoenix. See, I told you not to listen to that stupid preacher. He's always talking gloom and doom. Verse 14, but soon a tempestuous wind called the nor'ether, nor'easter. Now note, the south wind blew gently. The north wind blows temptuously. You see, there is another God that operates in our atmosphere, and it is the God of this earth. It is the lowercase g God, someone we like to call Satan. And he likes to, to think he has power over things too, which he does, but he doesn't have authority over it. So he blows a nice little soft wind to make them think that the preacher doesn't know what he's talking about. And then the real master of the wind says, I'll show you. Soon a tempestuous wind called the nor'easter struck down from the land, and when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Running along the lee of a small island called Caudia, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. So the ship's boat is like the little lifeboat. It's a, it's a little mooring boat that they pull behind the ship. Okay, we see now, you know, all you cruise people, they have the lifeboats tied up on the deck. They didn't have it like that. They, they towed it behind so that, that we, we had a difficult time even keeping the, 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 the ship's boat with us. So after hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then fearing that they would run aground in the Sirtis, they lowered the gear. And thus they were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, storm they began the next day to jettison the cargo. Now, stop. Can I get my map again? Here's where they think they are, okay? This is where they think they're headed, okay? This is an area called Major Sirtis, okay? They think that the wind has blown them all the way down into the Sirtis. Now, sailors know this bad place. This is a mountain range underneath of the ocean that at some points is only this far from the surface of the water. Ships don't like that. They think they're down here and they know they're going to hit one of these mountaintops and they're going to sink because 13,000 of their other brothers are down there right now. So they think they're headed to the Sirtis. Panic strikes them. This is what happens. This is what happens when we panic, okay? Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest laid on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. 
Here's what happens to you, Christian. Here's what happens to us. We get into the storm and we panic because we think we're heading for this massive disaster. And we panic and we throw away everything we actually need. I know, because I lived here for years in, in my life, in my walk. And when I got into the, the first storm that came to my Christian walk, I panicked and I threw everything away. What did I throw away? I threw away reading the Bible, fellowshipping with the saints, and praying. I got rid of church altogether because I was in a panic state. It wasn't doing what it was for, supposed to do for me. And now I'm in a panic state. And so I throw away everything I actually need the most. They're throwing the ship's tackle overboard to, to lighten the load. This is what we do. We isolate ourselves from other Christians. God's primary form of communication is through the Scripture, through prayer, and through the fellowship of the saints. What do we do? We stop reading our Bibles. We stop fellowshipping with the saints. We stop coming to church, and we stop praying. He doesn't hear me anyway, or I'm so bad that he won't listen to me anyway. These are the lies we tell ourselves. That's the soft wind that blows. Verse 18, I mean, verse 19. And on the third day, they threw the, tack, the, the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. With their own hands, they did it. They threw away that which they needed the most. Verse 21. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, <laughs> this is, this is a, little, a little bit of Paul comes out here, right? He says, Men, you, you, you should have listened to me uh, back there in Crete. So, so men, you, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. So it's a little bit of a told you so. All right, and it's hard sometimes for pastors. I've been a pastor for almost 20 years, and it's hard sometimes when people come back. You, you, they come to you for advice. Paul, you can relate to this. They come to you for advice. You pour scripture into them. You lay out a great plan, thus saith the Lord. Six months to a year later, they come back beat to tarnation, tore up, didn't follow a word of advice that you gave them, quit coming to church, quit praying, quit reading the Bible, burnt every bridge in their life, they come back smoking, snarled, teeth missing, and they're like, I don't know what happened. <laughs> and it's really hard to not go, hey, you remember when we met? It's hard not to do that, but Paul does that here, and he's the apostle, so I guess he gets to get away with it, and he says, hey, guys, you should have listened to me, okay? We're kind of in a little mess right now. You remember back there when I was like, hey, let's stay here at the Fair Havens. Let's not push this thing. You didn't listen. So here's Paul's second proclamation. He says, yet now I urge you to take heart. For there will be no loss of life among you. Now remember, back at Crete, even Paul was saying, hey, we're all going to die. If you leave here, we're dead. Now Paul is changing his story. What, what's going on? What happened? But only the ship. No, no life is going to be lost if we do what I'm about to say. Okay, here's what he says. For this very night... There stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong. He's establishing, hey, an angel of God spoke to me. Oh, by the way, I belong to the God who sent this angel to speak to me. To whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold... God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. And he says, but we must run aground on some island. And note he said island. He's very detailed. Because where are they worried about running aground? In the Sirtis, where there's no island. Ship, crash, burn, die, okay? Island, land, people, food, okay? Good. Paul is saying, 
I know because my God, whom I belong to and I worship, said it and it will happen exactly the way he says it'll happen. This is his second proclamation to them. Verse 27. When the 14th night had come, as we're being driven across the Adriatic Sea. Now he gives a, can, can we pull the map back up real quick? As we're being driven across, your, 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 your guys back there hate me. Um, as we're being driven across the Adriatic Sea, right? So we're just kind of floating. We're, 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 not even near, we're not even near the danger they think that they're in. But we're just kind of going across the Adriatic Sea. Just wanted you to know where we were in the story. So you guys are like, hey, I want to beat the Methodists to the uh, buffet. Um, when the 14th night had come and we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors, <laughs> I'll leave it to the sailors, sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding and found 20 fathoms. A little further, they took a sounding again and found 15 fathoms. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, okay, they did not hear a word Paul said, did they? Because he just said, we're going to run aground on an island. And they're still thinking they're in the Sirtis. Paul's establishing that we're not in the Sirtis, we're in the Adriatic Sea. But these guys aren't listening. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down the four anchors from the stern, and now they pray. And prayed, isn't that interesting, for day to come. What are you doing when you pray for day to come? You want to be able to see something, right? This is usually the first step when we're in a storm and we're in the violent storm and we're, we've thrown everything we need away and we decide to start communicating again. The first thing we do is ask for vision, right? It's actually selfish. It's actually a selfish prayer. It is. Because God already laid out the plan at the beginning for us and now we want to be able to see everything before we do it. That's actually selfish prayer. Just, that's, that's, you can put extra in the offering plate for that. <laughs> and fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down the anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under the pretense of laying out anchors from the bow. Here's what they were doing. There were a couple sailors that were like, hey, this ship's going down. And we're taking the lifeboat. Okay? We're getting out of here. So what we're going to do is we're going to pretend like we're anchoring. So, hey, Charlie, Eddie, buddy, let's get the lifeboat. Let's drop it in. Say, hey, guys, we're just going to go set some anchors. We'll be right back. And when we get out there, we're going to cut the rope. and We're going to row as fast as we can row because that ship's going down. Here's what Paul says when he sees this happening. Verse 30, and as the sailors were seeking to escape the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under the pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, <laughs> he's, he's talking to the most ungodly people on the boat, okay? This is what he says to the soldiers and the centurion, Julius. Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. What? Hear me again. Unless the, soldier, unless the centurion and the soldiers, I mean, unless the, these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Why? Let's go back to what he said. Everyone that travels with me stays alive. Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. Guess who became believers in the message right then and there? The soldiers and Julius. Their action showed their belief. They said, hey, get in here, sailor. Get up here, you knucklehead. Get over here. And they cut the boat away and said, nobody's leaving this ship. They showed an act of belief right then and there. We believe what this guy's saying now. We didn't believe him at Crete. We're believing him now. 
We're going to see a change in them in just a second. When the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. Verse 33. As day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you have continued in suspense without food, having taken in nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength. For not a hey, he's reiterating God's message to them. For not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And when he said these things, he took bread and gave thanks in the presence of all, and he broke it and gave it to them. Almost sounds like something we're going to do at the end of this service today. Then they all were encouraged, and they ate food. They were all encouraged, and they ate some food themselves. Now here's where we find out how many people were on this journey. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out wheat into the sea. I'm confused, Dan. Why is that a good thing? You just told me I shouldn't be throwing stuff overboard. Mm -mm. You need to know what to throw away when. Where are they getting ready to go? Paul said they're going to end up on a what? This is a responsive time. An island. Okay? He says, eat. Because we're going to run aground on an island and you're all going to live. And there's going to be a swim to the beach, baby. And somebody's going to have to have some strength. You go 14 days without food, you're not swimming to the beach. And nobody's dying, so you better eat. And they were encouraged and they ate. And now they are preparing for their landing. But unbelief continues to haunt us in every step of God's will. I want you to see this. Now, when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned to possibly run the ship ashore there. Hey, we don't have to wreck. We got the island. See, the, I see the island. Good job, Paul. Great. But look, there's like this little bay right here with a nice, soft, comfortable beach. Let's just float her on in there and park it. Isn't that what we do to God when God says, hey, do this, do this crazy thing that I'm asking you to do? And you're like, I'll do kind of the crazy thing. All right? I, it's, like, it's like, I'm not going to jump out of an airplane, but I'll bungee jump. They're still not believing God's promise to them. I want to land this thing better than the way God said it's going to end. I want to do this better than the way God said. Look, it makes perfect sense. How many of you have said that to God in your prayers? That it makes perfect sense for you to do it this way. But you know, convicted in your heart, you should do it another. I went through this when I planted a church in the middle of nowhere. It makes perfect sense for me to just stay on staff at this church and train up others to do such great duties. Why would I take my family from my good salary at my big church in my fancy city and go live on peanuts in the middle of nowhere? That makes no sense. Keep amen in, honey. And now that I look back on it, I wouldn't trade it for all the peanuts that I had before that journey. But here I am trying to land my ship in this nice, comfortable bay. I don't want to wreck the ship. It's not necessary, is it, God? It's not necessary to destroy the whole ship. Verse 40, So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea, at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. Verse 41. Every Christian story has a but. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. 
the bow struck, the bow struck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. Now, let's back up a minute. Remember I told you throwing stuff overboard wasn't such a bad thing this time? Because we have to know when to throw things overboard. They're going to be on an island, right? Surrounded by water. What were they throwing? Anybody want to go back and look? What were they throwing into the water? Barrels of grain. What eats grain when it's thrown in the water? Fish. They're going to be on an island with no way off that island. They throw grain into the water so that you feed the fish and the fish will feed you. You feed the fish and the fish will feed you. This is a, this is a, this is a, this is a concept that they're not seeing. Throw the grain overboard. Paul is saying, I'm preparing dinner, okay? This is what you throw overboard. The things that are going, this is what you throw overboard to the, to the culture and to the community and to your, your neighborhood and to your coworkers. You throw yourself in there because when you feed the fish, the fish will feed you. That old adage that the giver gets more than the receiver, that is God honest truth. We throw ourselves out there and we feed the fish. The fish will feed us. 42, the soldiers, here we go. All these little steps of unbelief all the way right up. The the ship is wrecking right now. Here's the ship wrecking right now. We're at the end of the story. We already know. Okay, whoop, the ship's wrecking. Everybody swim to the beach. Here's some more disbelief. Verse 42. We're just packing disbelief into 39 through the end of the passage. The soldiers plan to kill the prisoners. Lest any should swim away and escape. Now, these are soldiers. These are soldiers of the Augustan cohort. They have a mission and a plan. And they have a directive from their boss. And prisoner transport. Prisoners try to escape. You kill them. Okay? Okay? So they reverted right back to what they knew instead of what they believed. They went back to what they knew instead of what they believed. They had just believed him earlier and said, hey, no, 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 no. Get up in here and cut that boat loose. Act of faith. Moments later, they're drawing their swords and getting ready to kill the passengers, getting ready to kill the prisoners. But the centurion wishing to save Paul. Look at the verse. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, here's where we see that relationship that we had at the beginning of the story, where he lets him go get cared for by his brothers. and Chris. Julius saw something in Paul that he did not see in himself, and he wanted to know what it was. And he found it in this journey. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on planks or pieces of the ship. So it was that all were brought safely to land. Exactly as God had said it would be. Exactly as God had said it would be. Note that they floated to shore on pieces of the destruction that came as a result of the crashing ship. Now, let's take a step back. What are we talking about? Can I get my map up? This is the last time, guys, I promise. Well, I might not make that promise. But anyway, this was Paul in the beginning. This was even Paul's intention was to come here and 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 work his way there and then take a nice little bus across to Rome. That was everybody's initial intention. This was the best laid plan. This was the design. This is exactly it. I'm going to work as a as a as a as a as a cashier, then I'm going to be a manager, then I'm going to be a regional guy, then I'm going to move into... 
and then I'm going to go here, and I'm going to move this place, and I'm going to go all this, and I'm going to do all this. And God's going, "Uh uh-uh, buddy, you're going to Malta. And we fight him, and we argue, and we look for a beach to land the ship on. Let me tell you why all this happened. Everybody always wants to know, well, why did that happen? Let me tell you why this happened. If you read, and we don't have time today, because Paul won't let me preach much longer. He's already gone. So, look in chapter 28. There's your answer. They land on this little island down here called Malta, just below, just, just right here, right here, Malta. This is, the, this is the island that they must run aground on. And note, Paul said, we must run aground. We must. That part of the story never changes, and it didn't. Why must we run aground on Malta? Well, to give you the fast-forward version, you can go read the book later. There's a guy on that island named Publius, and he has a dad who's pretty old and pretty sick. And after Paul gets bit by a snake and survives, he draws attention. People, a crowd gathers, and he wins an entire village of people to Christ that were not part of the plan. They weren't part of his plan. They weren't part of the centurion's plan. They weren't part of the sailor's plan. They weren't part of anybody's plan but God's plan. And God's plan will always land where it's supposed to go even if you're floating to the end on pieces of the wreckage. So Paul's first thing was, hey, we can make this trip a little easier. Even Paul was like, hey, let's not leave Crete. Let's just wait here, okay? Let's just wait here. And even God said, no, you got to go to Malta. You're still going to go to Rome. By the way, story, sorry, if you read to the end. He dies in Rome. Sorry, sorry, he dies in Rome. He gets his head cut off. And you know what? He still arrives where God ultimately landed him, and that is in martyrdom. That's where he landed. That's what his end was, and Paul knew that. Paul knew if he goes to Caesar, he's going to have the biggest audience that he can preach the gospel to. He showed it to us in in 25, In chapter 25, he goes before King Agrippa and he has this big audience of people and he preaches the gospel to them and he shares Jesus with them and he says, send me to Rome. What? Don't do that. And even King Agrippa says, man, we would have cut him loose today. Why did he want to go to Rome? Why would you want to go to Rome? Caesar's going to cut his head off. And he did but not before he preached the gospel to probably the largest audience of people that he ever got to preach to and wrote a bunch of prison epistles that we still benefit from today. So I have a couple questions for us as a family of God. Where are you in the story? Have you just started the journey? Maybe you just became a Christian. Maybe you just became a believer and you have your, you have your life mapped out already. You just got married. You know how many kids you're going to have. You know exactly where you're going to, what neighborhoods you're going to start your first house in, move your second house to, and you're going to build up on the mountain when we turn 40. Maybe that's you. You've got it all mapped out. You already know. Why? Because my mom and my dad have been there before, and they know the way to go. I'm telling you, This is you. Because God has a plan that often doesn't match yours. That doesn't mean you still won't get the house on the mountain at 40. But you're going to float up there on pieces of the wreckage. And it's going to be glorious. It's going to be amazing. You don't get to tell this story when you do this. I guarantee you those guys, those Roman soldiers, they got back. They, they, they made it back to Rome. And man, I know, I spent 20 years in the service. That story got really blown up. We were fighting off pirates. And 
They had a story to tell. But something happened there around that campfire in Malta where Paul gets bit by a snake and the village comes around and everybody come, becomes a believer. I, I, I can almost guarantee, I have no scriptural support for it, but I can almost guarantee that some of those soldiers came to Christ around that campfire. I'm going to leave you with this verse. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. God's got this, y'all. Surrender to the wind. Go where he sends. Your best laid plans are often in conflict with his perfect will. You want to map it out? Start here. Right here. Because Paul's third missionary journey was a lot different than the first two. But the dividends from that third one? Eternal. Eternal. So if you're struggling right now, and you're, you're a brand new Christian, or maybe you're a Christian that's been a Christian all your life, and you just feel like you've constantly been trying to jump in the boat and cut loose. And just get, get away from it all. Man, you need to get some people in your life that'll say, get that boat up here and stay on board. Because God's going to land us exactly where he wants us to be. And it ain't going to be floating into the beach and walking off the ship. Get some people in your life, and I believe you have a pastor that does that, that'll tell you, get on this boat and stay put. Because he's going to land this thing, and it's going to be glorious. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity. This was, this was a message for, for believers. This was a message for those that, that are in conflict with your will. They don't even know that they are, or some of them do. Some of them know that you have a calling on their life and they're not going where you want them to go. And so the wind is blowing and the storm is coming. I pray that they do not jettison the cargo of the ship, but that they relax in the wind, that they eat food and be strong for where you will land them. God, maybe there's an unbeliever in this room right now who has been skeptical of faith in Jesus Christ. Why Jesus? Why can't it be Mohammed? Why can't it be the Hindus? Why can't it be self-examination? Why Jesus? Lord, I pray that they ask the question, why is there a way at all? Why would a righteous and holy God take a rebellious and sinful creation that rebelled against Him and give up perfection, put on flesh, live perfectly, die sacrificially, take on our payment and punishment, and then impute to us righteousness that we would be seen as he is seen in your eyes. Why would you do that? Because you love us. And you made that way. And that is the way. That is the truth. And that is the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. No one survives unless they stay on the ship. Father, I just pray that you would convict the heart of those that maybe are in this room that are unbelieving. Maybe those that will watch this video, whether it's tomorrow or whether it's 10 years from now. Or, or a Christian who is struggling with your will, who is fighting against their plans and yours. May that conflict end and may they surrender to the power and the beauty of your perfect will. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.